To Naked to Hide by Nina J. Coles Chapter 13 After Lunch The Right Thing to Do and Five Senses Lunch was over. We ordered to a cafe espresso. Mercedes quickly cleared the table. She took the bread basket, the oil and vinegar, the empty water bottle. Then she took the empty breadstick wrappers. Her hands were thick, but her movements swift and precise. Jacopo observed those movements. He felt a beginning of a heartburn, but at least lunch was over. Because, really, what does this one have that other woman don't? Nothing, nothing. Okay, that was a stupid question. In any case, you'd soon get tired of her, bored to death. But I still can't understand Giovanna's rage. She was beside herself. She was... She said something about some letters. What did she read? Well, I'm not sure. Look here, I have had enough of this half-truth. Okay, Giovanna was in touch with her husband. And? And he showed her what he found on her computer. And? And it was instant messages. It was what? A conversation via computer. What? <laughs> you were even talking to her? Please, avocado. Okay, sorry. What did you two write about? About our private, our personal things. Your personal things. Yours and theirs and their husbands, uh, it seems like. Well, uh, so, what did you write? I asked her to marry me, among other things. What? Yes, I asked her to marry me. But that wasn't important. You are a fool, Jacopo. Clinically insane. I know. What do you mean it wasn't important? I made a mistake. I said things like that without giving them too much thought. Sure, Giovanna may buy that line, not me. Mercedes came with two cafe espressos and the bill. His father-in-law took it and put it in his pocket without even looking at it. He then took out his wallet pulled out a 100 euro bill and paid. Jacopo didn't even have the time to try and pick up the bill first. Paying for lunch would have changed the horizon of his thoughts for a moment. Mercedes looked seriously worried. She looked at them, both silent and brooding in their thoughts. She headed to the kitchen and left them alone. His heart burned was working its way up. It churned in black swirls, dark red flares, flames glowing deep within his bowels. Maybe he had an Alka-Seltzer in his uh, briefcase, but the briefcase was left in his office, in that hideous office with a fly inanely flattering around. And may I ask, where's the woman now? You pulled out and she stayed out? You were so lovely, Dove, maybe she could have come to take you away, leave everything and stay with you, call you something. Did you think about that? What's the hussy now? A shining heart, huh? <laughs> Spineless, take my word. Jacopo hadn't heard that term for the longest time. Spineless. She was not spineless. He knew that, but he couldn't talk. He was going to manage to just keep quiet. Mercedes came out with the change. His father-in-law took it without a look. He opened his wallet and stuck the bills in, folded in half. He left all the coins on the table. Mercedes came back. Lunch wasn't over yet. You're a grown man. I can't tell you what to do. His father-in-law took his cell phone. A gust of wind rose up through the square and sneaked under the tablecloth. Dark clouds cast their cloud over the sun, the sky imbued with imminent rain. 
but I'll tell you one thing, just one. He dialed a number on his cell phone. Maya, good morning. Can you pick me up with the car, please? My legs hurt and it seems like it's about to rain. I'm at Mercedes uh, Trattoria. Yes, yes, right away. Thanks. Thank you, Maya. He put his phone down. She's on her way. Would you look at this weather? It's gonna come pouring down, heavy rain and a hailstorm. He sat, silent. Then looked at Jacopo. That's when he realized he had kept his sunglasses on for the entire lunch. He took them off. The sky was bordered with heavy, dark clouds. They looked at each other in the eyes. Do what you think best, but remember the kids, yours and theirs. This one has a family, a marriage of 20 years behind her. That's nothing you should take lightly. There are children in the way, remember. They got up. Finally, lunch was over. His stomach was aflame. I'll be there at one. I can make it any earlier. Okay, no worries. I'm inside already. I'll get something ready. Yes, but I wanted to buy something. There's nothing in the house. Don't worry. I'm an expert of creative cuisine. I am. I didn't put the wine in the fridge. Will you stop fussing? It's all under control. Let me handle things. I'm opening the fridge now. Oh! What? Oh! I had never set eyes inside a single fridge. Scary. Mmm, let's see. Octopus salad, vacuum packet. But before September 10th. That's gonna be hard to chew. Octopus should be eaten fresh. What's an octopus like with four months of shelf life? Can you imagine? Oh, come on. Ah, and grated parmesan. One, no, three packet of grated parmesan. Okay, I'll see you at one. All right, all right. I'm closing the fridge and getting lunch ready. Should I get anything? No, I told you, I'll make something up. I love cooking. I'll ring you when I get there. I'm not opening. Why? I'm not opening the door to anyone. You have your keys. Okay, so I'm talking to Chiara and I'm there. Don't be mean to Chiara. But she is so dull. Don't be mean. Okay, okay, I won't be mean. See you in a little bit. Bye. Bye. Oh, one more thing. Yes? Turn the radio down a little. Bye, bad boy. And don't clean up the kitchen. That's my job. Bye, Jacopo. I like it when you search me, when I cook for you. I feel your swift, wildless hands slipping in, brushing against my breasts, rippling around my hips, and then leave as we talk of us and of the world. You walk to the table Set the white dishes down, vegetables stirring in the pan, dancing, leaping, and again your hands search me. Claim the small of my neck, a gentle thirst to bend my head. You lightly touch my ear and leave again. And once more you're back at the table, open a bottle of sparkling wine, nibble on a breadstick, place a bottle of water. Then your hands together land on my hips and take them, assertive, strong, unbordering the weight of the body. Your body leaning on kneeling, kissing, while I pour tomatoes over seedling, carrots, celery, and onion. You walk away, and I don't have the time to marvel at the quick movement, as now you talk, you tell your day, you ask for mine, words that come and go, 
tangling crystal and light-hearted laughter, a harmony of vi and consonant notes, lost away in the bubbling water, a joyful gurgling spreading its arms. I like it when you search me and your eyes linger on my cleavage and your lips tighten a quick thought crosses your mind. But I talk away while I pour noodles in the water and you encircle my waist with one single arm and celebrate our being together sipping white wine and kissing me. I close my eyes and the light of the world floods over me. I like our dance, the harmonious steps, one around the other, pasta drained, table set, kisses, smiles, words. I like it when you search me with your hands, caressing my arms and the back of my fingers touching my breast with that sabbat line of your smile, your eyes in mine. And I am still amazed, my eyes closed and the light of the world flooding over me. He got to the office in Monselice a handful of seconds before the rain started pouring. Heavy drops of rain that would soon turn into hail. The wind blew fierce gusts. The office was empty. The girls were off to lunch. He opened the door to his room and found it empty and silent, as predicted. He looked around to spot the fly, nowhere to be seen. He turned the light on sat on the chair where his father-in-law had sat earlier, and waited, absorbed in the silence of the room. Outside, the rain gushed down, roaring. The coffee was no longer steaming from the small paper cups. I can't do this. I can't. Oh, maybe I can. I can't do this. Yes, I am sure I can. And then there were their instant messaging, mysterious dialogues involving unpredictably, inexplicably pulling out of their fingers words they couldn't utter, who shared conversation that touched on their deepest emotions. Talking with her had become a daily appointment since February. Instant messaging was the summa maxima of absence. They lacked everything that makes a normal conversation a conversation. And yet, typing words annulled all five of their senses. No taste. There was no food, no coffee, no millefoglie cake, no taste of her skin, no touch. She couldn't take his hand and dive into his open, white, soft palm like a kitten. He couldn't move her hair from her forehead, brush against her naked arm, take her shoulders and draw her closer. No sense of smell. There was no chant of the food and wine that accompanied their meetings and marked the territory around them. Further away came the aroma of coffee. Closer and neck emanated a delicate scent of flowers, a contribution of no parfum, just the smell of her skin in the lovely penetrating in his nostrils and floating up to his brain like a chemical marker set to be recognized and welcomed. No sense of hearing. Their words had no sound, no warm voice reciting, no sudden rings of laughter substituted on the screen by emoticons, round, yellow, smiley faces invented to say everything that you can say with words. 
There was no cadence, no intonation, no sights, no pauses, no alternating lows and highs. And finally, no sense of sight. No eyes looking straight into his, piercing him to the core. No eyes lingering on the objects around them, while her hands swirled and danced. No lips opening into a full smile. No eyelids squinting in search of answers. No pupils dilatating, taking him in, vast, unbounded. All they were left with was words strings in which to quickly write short sentences, always short, because the other couldn't sit there too long for a full sentence to be completed, and you didn't want to wait too long to read the things she had written. The speed of thought was only slightly slowed down by the time it takes to type a word, and often sentences came out full of typos. She'd always write what instead of want, and Jacopo would always pronounce knocking instead of nothing, no time to go back and correct. Instant messaging forced them to read short thoughts written quickly, formulate coherent sentences and type them fast, not thinking too much of the consequences of words, and instant messaging allowed them to push the line, to not evaluate pros and cons, to laugh to themselves, to imagine her sitting before the screen typing, to leap past the mark of unspoken rules, where maybe the five senses would have prevented them to step any further, as the brain quickly weighted up the consequences of the situation. Instant messaging was a secluded place, protected and yet hazardous, as it stimulated the imagination without allowing any judgment on what they both wrote. Their conversations were like sea waves at the rise of the tide, gentle and seemingly harmless, cheerful lounges embroidered in white foam, moving inch by inch further into the coast, each wave almost identical to the previous, and yet just slightly more inwards, until they filled the whole beach, erasing sand castles and footsteps, sealing holes and filling everything with fresh, lively water. When the conversation were over, the waves pulled back, leaving their shoreline renewed, clean, wool, smooth, still, calm. Now, those conversations floated somewhere in the limbo of the Internet, saved in some place out of reach, forever lost in the ocean of global communication, forever fixed in their subconscious mind, fried, forlorn, lost. They had let themselves be captured by their conversation as if by a thick, invisible spider web made of thin yet sturdy silk threads. Their relationship was born there before any other place. How about a sip of whiskey? Are you kidding me? No, I can't. She laughed, impersonably shrinking back. She turned to him. They were laying on his beanbag, freshly renovated. He lifted a strand of hair from her eyes. Why not? Oh, it's bad for me, I can't. What do you mean it's bad for you? You're not a non-drinker, are you? No, I'm not. But when I was young, I got drunk on whiskey and I was never able to drink again. All right, tell the story. No, there's nothing to tell. I got drunk and that's it. She got up abruptly. He didn't stop her. She sat on a chair and picked Jacopo's shirt from the sofa. She put it on. Then she stood up again, as if standing on springs, and walked to the kitchen. Shall I put some coffee on? Why don't you want to tell me? About what? About the whiskey, for example. About you. There's nothing to tell. 
married for 20 years, two children, a college degree, a job somewhere in the middle, a naked man lying over a bean bag in front of me. She turned towards him and smiled. That's all. Oh, that's not true. Why don't you talk to me? Because it only hurts me. It hurts you to talk to me? What is that supposed to mean? She turned the fire under the mock. I moved to the cupboard, extracted two espresso cups and placed them on the table. Then she took the coffee jar and placed it on the kitchen counter and took the two sides of the open shirts, pulling them tighter. Okay, I had some alcohol issues when I was young. I was, I guess, 17, 16, and then... Alcohol issues? Yes, I got drunk all the time, okay? Every Saturday night and every Sunday, and sometimes during the week. It was always hard drinks, some mighty heavy drinking. Went off uh, on a few benders. Wow. That's it. The end. Just few boozing sprees. And how's whiskey involved in this? In no way. Well, actually, one time I drank a half bottle of whiskey all by myself. I was never good girl. I passed out for about four hours. But it only happened with whiskey. With other heavy drinks, I don't have any problems. I can drink trunkfuls of them. I can hold my drink. She turned towards the mocker. She lifted the lid to see if the coffee had already risen to the upper section, frothing up. And then? Then what? Then, after the bruising spree, or after... Nothing. It was just a drinking boat. Nothing special. Let's just say I was a complicated teenager and ended up in the wrong ends. But when I pulled myself together, that's all. I took my life back under control. And why does it hurt to talk about it? She said nothing and stopped breathing. She froze, her hands behind her back. Honey, you never told me anything about you before your husband. Oh, please, there's nothing interesting to tell. I had a few relationships, uh, that's all. She again walked to the cupboard. She opened it and took out a box with cookies. Jacopo's shirt fluttered on her back. Her breathing had become light, as if suspended, gauzy. Are you okay? She placed the cookies on the table and then looked at him with earnest, keen eyes. Eh, yes, I am okay. Mm. No, no, mm. Will you talk a bit? About? <sighs> About your things, the years before your husband. Oh, please, Jacopo, there's nothing worth telling. Come on, talk to me, just a bit. I do talk to you. Not true. They both remained silent. Coffee's ready. The sudden ring of her voice startled him. He got up, naked as he was, walked up to her and kissed her as she poured the coffee carefully into the tiny cups. He encircled her hips and peeked from behind her shoulder to see the coffee flowing into her cups. A silver smoke rose in silky circles. The fragrance of coffee flooded the room. She had stiffened slightly. He circled his arms around her waist. Mmm, that smells good. Even coffee turns into a wonder when you make it. She laughed. The tension eased. His blue shirt was open and he could see the soft curves of her breast and round abdomen. His arms prevented him to look any further down. There, coffee's ready. She turned to him and looked at him in the eye. He kissed her lips. Mmm, the best coffee of my life. To think I had asked for a whiskey. Translation from Italian by Iris Cartia. 
Original music by Massimo Moretti for Maxmore Music. Post production editing by Gina Lee. All mistakes are mine. If you want to see pictures of making off and life in Italy, please follow me, Nina J. Kors, on Instagram and LinkedIn. <laughs>